Welcome back to The Legal Brief, the show where we crush the various legal myths and misinformation surrounding various areas of the gun world. I'm your host, Adam Kraut, and today we're going to talk about 80% receivers. Have you ever wondered how many things you can attach to your gun with the KDG Connect and side lock mounts? It's a lot. But just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Kinetic Development Group. Keep it simple, stupid. To get 10% off your entire order, use the code TGC10 at KineticDG.com. After the video about marking your Form 1 NFA firearms, a lot of you guys wanted a video on 80% receivers. So here it is. We're going to break this down into three segments. First, starting with what is an 80% receiver. Second being, what are the legalities behind one? And third, life after you complete one. So let's get started, shall we? What exactly is an 80% receiver? Well, judging by the name, it's obviously a receiver that only needs 20% more work to make it an actual receiver, right? Look. I went to law school because I wasn't good at math, but even I know that seems like it's fairly straightforward. Well, if we were to actually think about it or do some investigation, well, we'd actually be wrong if we were to believe it's only 20%. It's actually just a marketing term that the industry's created. ATF doesn't even recognize the term as having any meaning. In fact, in some determination letters as recently as 2014, ATF has stated, for your information, the ATF does not recognize the term 80% receiver. However, since we aren't the ATF, to us, typically it refers to a receiver forging, at least in the context of an AR-15, that has had some machining operations performed. Like this one. Some of the stuff's been done to it, but it's still solid in here. As far as the ATF is concerned, a receiver has either been completed to the point it is a firearm, as defined by the Gun Control Act, or it hasn't been. Which begs the question then, at what point does an 80% receiver actually become something ATF cares about? Well, in order to understand at what point that happens, we need to examine how the GCA defines the term firearm. I know, more boring legal definitions. It's not like the show's called the legal brief or anything, right? Anyway, the term firearm means A, any weapon including a starter gun which will or is designed to or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive, B, the frame or receiver of any such weapon, and a few other things that really aren't pertinent to this discussion. Don't you guys worry, or fret, whatever you may be doing at home, I'll include links for the relevant portions of law, regulations, and whatever other material I think is important for you guys to have right at your little fingertips. <laughs> that information will be down in the description. There are a couple of important things to consider here. ATF has long held that receiver blanks, casting, or machine bodies in which the fire control group cavity area has remained solid, and that's the trigger group area for you guys who don't know at home, the uninitiated if you will, that the item has not yet reached a state of manufacture which would result in it being classified as a firearm. So if we look at a typical 80% AR-15 receiver, we can see that you have to mill out the area for the hammer and trigger. Turning back to the definition of a firearm, we see in part A that any weapon which will or is designed to or can readily be converted to expel a projectile by action of an explosive is a firearm. We also see that the frame or receiver of any such weapon is also a firearm. So here's why this fire control group or trigger group area cavity being left intact is so important to the determination of whether something is a firearm or it's not. Let's say, for instance, that on an AR-15 lower receiver, the manufacturer left the magazine well area solid, but had completed the area where the trigger or hammer are installed. Well, if a person were to take that part, install other AR-15 parts to it, slap an upper on top of it, it could be used to fire around. Thus, it would be a firearm. A really useless one, but eh, whatever. <laughs> However, in the instance where the fire control group cavity is solid, none of that would be possible, and as such, we don't have a firearm. So, in short, an 80% receiver is nothing more than a forging, machine body, or other thing that has yet to meet the criteria to be deemed a firearm. That said, if you're in the business of making or selling these, you probably want to make sure what you're making or selling is not a firearm, not based on what I say in the video, but based on a determination letter from ATF. And yeah, that's something I handle. Shameless plug right here. <laughs> now, onto the legalities behind owning an 80% receiver. The first place to start is, are there any legalities? Well, given that an 80% receiver is not a firearm and is just a hunk of metal, it's unregulated by federal law. 
So there's nothing on the federal level that would prevent you from acquiring an 80% receiver, which brings us to several other questions like who can complete them, what are you required to do after you complete them, and other things you should probably know. Let's begin with there's a whole lot of other mis and misinformation out there from those who graduated from the Mark Zuckerberg School of Law floating around the internet. It's perfectly legal for you to build your own firearm provided you don't violate the GCA or the National Firearms Act. There's also no restriction on a firearm built from an 80% receiver from being passed on to your heirs after you croak. And contrary to popular belief, there's no requirement that you destroy it either or that it be destroyed when you die. What is not legal is for you to build firearms to sell without obtaining an FFL. ATF also published a ruling in the beginning of 2015 which held that any person, and this includes legal entities, who was engaged in the business of machining, molding, casting, forging, printing, or other manufacturing processes to create a firearm frame or receiver must be licensed under the GCA as a manufacturer, mark that firearm in accordance with the regulations, and maintain manufacturing records. The same ruling also held that a business, including an association or society, could not avoid those requirements by allowing other persons, presumably those who own the 80% receiver, to manufacture the firearm using equipment under the dominion and control of the business. So if you were a member of a machine shop co-op or something along those lines, that is essentially what ATF was seeking to regulate. Essentially in response to individuals hosting build parties where they could actually show up, pop their lower into the CNC machine and press go, they said no more to that. When we were getting ready to film the video on this segment, John asked me, well, what if a person were to go to their friend's house and use the equipment there, or their friend was to do the work for him? Well, the answer hasn't changed all that much. If the friend is running the machine, the friend is the one who actually manufactured the firearm. If you're just using their equipment, the answer is a little less clear, but it would seem that ATF would contend that person's now engaged in the business of manufacturing firearms, possibly. And now for the question that a lot of you folks had after the NFA engraving video is, do you need to engrave a firearm made from an 80% receiver? Well, if the firearm is being made into an NFA firearm, like a short barrel rifle, the answer is yes, absolutely. If we're talking about a firearm being made into a regular Title I firearm, the answer is no. Remember, we're dealing with two different sections of law, one being the National Firearms Act and the other being the Gun Control Act. Under the National Firearms Act, and you may remember this from the other video, you as the maker are required to mark that firearm under 27 CFR 479.102. I was able to turn up a letter from 2004 where ATF said that if we're talking about an 80% receiver, that firearm remained in the custody of the maker, it would not need to be marked. But if it were later sold or transferred, it would need to be marked in accordance with the regulations found in section 478.92. The problem with that is that the letter cites to a regulation which deals specifically with licensed manufacturers and licensed importers and has no relevance to an individual maker. Here's why you aren't required to mark the firearm under the Gun Control Act. There is nothing in the law or regulations of the GCA that requires an individual to mark a firearm they built. The regulations that deal with marking firearms pertain only to licensed manufacturers and licensed importers. You can find those at 27 CFR 478.92. Nevertheless, ATF suggests and strongly suggests that you mark the firearm in order to help aid them with tracing purposes should that firearm ever show up in a crime. So what's the deal with 80% lowers? Well, number one, they're not firearms as defined by the Gun Control Act, which is why they're not regulated on a federal level. Speaking from a federal law perspective, there is nothing that prevents you from owning one because it's no different than a paperweight or a block of metal, regardless of what the idiot politicians in California tell you. You can pass on a firearm you built yourself without having to destroy it, and there's no requirement that you engrave it, but rather a strong suggestion, and that's just to help law enforcement. Don't forget, companies are no longer able to offer build parties where they provide the equipment and some instruction for you to do the work, regardless of whether they're licensed or not. Hopefully that clears up some of the misinformation out there surrounding 80% receivers. If you guys like this episode, I need you to share it out on social media wherever you can. Also like it, don't forget to do that. You have a question you want answered on the show, do me a favor, let me know down in the comments below. As always, check out The Gun Collective on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Full30, Snapchat, and wherever else you can catch us. And as always, thanks for watching. The shirts worn in today's episode of The Legal Brief have been provided by Patriot Patch. Click the link in the description to learn more.